Howdy, everyone. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, competitive government and seasteading. Um, I, you know, I could easily talk about either of these things for an hour. So cramming them both in 20 minutes, it's going to be quick. All I can really do is give you kind of a quick sketch of some of these ideas. So just understand that there's a lot of thought behind these ideas. This is kind of a, a tiny selection of them. You know, it's not like a, a government program where people have to work hard to find like one angle of argument that justifies it. You know, it's more like there's so many different ways to explain this and we have to pick, you know, one of the many good ones. All right, let's dive in. So the, the key metaphor I'd, I'd kind of like is to get people to think about government more as entrepreneurs and consumers and less as this kind of deep moral thing. So let's talk about government as an industry. So every year our phones get smarter and our cars get safer and our medical treatments get more advanced. You know, to look through an old magazine, it, we, we can't help but laugh at the primitive technology. You know, like, it tapes tapes. Wow, right? And, and now we have iPods. And, you know, so we all benefit from the fact that startups try new things and compete with established companies through innovation. So why is it that in America, where I come from, one of the most advanced countries in the world, we're using the legal technology of 1787, right? If you drove a car from 1787, it would be a horse. So what's going on? We've learned so much about economic psychology, about complex systems, about so many fields in the past 200 years. Surely some new forms of government are possible now that weren't possible before. I mean, technological change, the internet, must have enabled a new form of government that didn't exist before. So why don't we have these new government technologies? And I think the best way to figure this out is to move away from this idea of government as a moral center. This is the White House in the US, which I don't really consider a moral center. But what I'd like to say is like, let's not even ask that question. Let's instead think of countries as, as firms, as companies, and citizens as customers. For example, consumer electronics. Companies develop technology, they produce products, they compete for customers. And I know that a lot of us care a lot about morality and the moral dimensions of political philosophy, and I'm not denying that this exists. What I'm suggesting is that the most productive path forward is actually to set aside discussions of morality temporarily. And in fact, I think that focusing on morality has been crippling to freedom activism and has made us as individuals kind of miserable. Um, that is, that we've turned the practical problem of there's this cartel that produces bad products, and that really sucks. I mean, it kills people. It sucks. And the, but the question of how do you crack this cartel, even if that question is guided by our hearts, it is a deeply intellectual and analytical question. What are the incentives of the world? How has this power perpetuated itself? How can we alter the flow of power in the world so as to change things? If we instead think of it as this noble struggle of good versus evil, where we few brave souls are struggling almost helplessly against this immensely powerful and merciless enemy of the state, you know, that makes an incredible storyline, right? There's no doubt about what, what, which I approach gets the movie rights. But I think it's actually deeply flawed at understanding the real problem and figuring out how to fix it. And we instead need to look at things in a totally different way. Fortunately, we can look at things in a different way because our brains have this component of morality, good and evil, arguing in small groups, but we also have this very different way of thinking, providing services, creating value, and this way of thinking will give us the answer. If we're gonna think as entrepreneurs, if we're gonna look at government as an industry, one question we might ask is like, how, how big is it? Is it, worth, is it worth bothering with it? You know, is it worth our time as entrepreneurs to break this cartel? Well, government is the biggest industry in the world. It's number one, it's 30% of GDP. You know, people talk about disrupting medicine or energy or education, you know, those are, those are small potatoes, right? This is the big one. The biggest firm had 2009 revenues of $2.5 trillion. But this industry is so bad that this leading firm lost $1.4 trillion. And it's a top company. The worst companies kill many of their own customers. This is a great picture of North Korea and South Korea at night. 
you can see a little bit of difference in how much light they have. And there wasn't very much difference between them in 1945, but they started using different governance technologies, right? They, they chose different products, and this had a dramatic effect over decades, right? We've got one tiny little light there next to Kim Jong-il, and South Korea is, is, is lit up. So that's sort of the puzzle that we're confronted with. As analysts, this is a puzzle. Big industry, really important, no innovation, or almost no innovation. So, you know, why is it? Is this a market failure? And, you know, can we cash in on it as entrepreneurs? You know, it's a great problem for humanity. That's the negative view. But the entrepreneurial view is every great problem is a great business opportunity, a great chance to create value. So that was sort of the, the quick intro. Now I'm going to present a model for how to think about competitive governance. And this model, before I fill in the blanks, I, just, I want to say that the, the key insight is that we think about government on multiple levels. And I'm leaving this blank right now before you get hooked on arguing about one level or a different level. But that a powerful way to look at the world can be to see that things that we see that are very visible are often caused by deeper processes underneath. And economics teaches this all the time. Prices. It looks like prices is this thing that's chosen by the seller. And if he increases his prices in a time of shortage, like selling air conditioners more expensive when it suddenly gets hot, or water when there's a, a, an emergency, that looks like this, this horrible, evil thing this person is doing. But then we learn supply and demand, and we understand that the intersection of these curves is what leads to prices. And if you try to set it to some different place, you get problems, that it, it emerges from human action, not human design. And this is very, very true for government. So what is, the, what is the visible manifestation of government? It is laws. They affect us directly. We see a bad law and we say, that's a bad law, here's a better law. And unfortunately, most political activism, much of our emotional energy is focused on, on how we could have better laws, like complaining about bad laws and suggesting better laws. Um, un unfortunately, laws are themselves an emergent phenomenon. And I won't try to explain this because we have 60 years of Nobel Prize winning economics in a field called public choice theory that explains that the degree to which political systems shape laws. That laws don't just emerge in a vacuum. They aren't just chosen by lawmakers, but that all kinds of subtle pressures affect them. And it turns out that, for example, representative democracy is not a system of incentives that leads to good laws in the sense of laws that achieve what the average voter wants. That's sort of a naive expectation, but it, it's not true. Instead, our representative democracies are machines for making laws that benefit special interests. You know, one just very short example, I mean, some of you may be familiar with the logic, some of you may not be, but suppose there's a legal change that will benefit 10 people by $5 million each. You know, maybe it's to protect some species. And there are some people who have the patent on the best technology for protecting this species. And, but it's going to hurt, say, every person in the U.S. It will hurt by one dollar. 300 million people lose one dollar each. So the benefit of this is 50 million. The cost is 300 million. If we used Fred's revelation system to actually understand people's true costs and decide whether to do this, this law would never pass. In a democracy, this law will pass every time. In fact, I would argue that most paragraphs of most laws in a democracy are attempting to do this, to take a little bit from the many and give to the few. And now when you talk, when you say take from the many and give to the few, oh, because those bad people are stealing from the... But that's not it at all, it's the incentives. Do you know about every paragraph in every law in your country that might cost you one dollar? Uh, of course not, you, you can't know. But if some law was gonna make you five million dollars, you would know. You, you probably wrote that paragraph. <laughs> I'm sure you're good friends with the, the politicians who are sponsoring it. And so these laws pass again and again, not because of good or bad, not because of who's in charge, but because that's the incentives that democracy sets up. And if we set up different incentives, uh, whether Fred's system or something else, we would get different results. And the sad thing is that, that these insights are often ignored and never disputed that we literally we have 60 years of Nobel Prize winning economics about how all of the improvement, all of the better laws that economists have crafted, clever, clever ways to achieve a given end in an efficient, optimal way, 
They don't happen. And economics tells us why they don't happen. But instead of economics saying, okay, given that, how can we actually change the world to create a world where good laws pass? You know, where instead of Fred coming and lecturing here to a small group of devotees, I want, I want a corporation that runs a private city to be paying him $500 an hour to explain to them how to create efficient laws, right? All these economists who sort of, you know, as hobbyists or out of their, their passion are coming up with these better systems, you know, these people should be highly paid consultants. But that's not happening because we don't have a world in which political systems are being tried in many different ways in a market. Um, and the way to see this is to look, we're gonna look at an even higher level above political systems. So public choice differentiated laws from political systems. And James Buchanan, who won a Nobel for public choice, said it was politics without romance. We're gonna look at political systems as systems of economic incentives. But romance crept in. He posited a constitutional moment when disinterested parties acting behind a, a Rawlsian veil of uncertainty would design the optimal constitution. Now, maybe one of you has met a disinterested party. I, I never have. There is no constitutional moment. Well, all we have is a world with an ongoing process in which occasionally, by accident, we get to try new systems of government. Estonia, by historical accident, when the Baltics were freed from the USSR, got to try the flat tax. Singapore, through historical accident and a, you know, an extraordinary individual, got to create more of a corporate state sort of system. But these only happen occasionally by accident. The thing is that you can take the same idea of multiple levels, one level higher, and you can say, all right, political systems don't arise in a vacuum. They're shaped by the incentives of this government industry. Let's think like entrepreneurs. What characteristics does this industry have? Well, one is that moving countries is very difficult and expensive. And of course, as a consumer, the harder it is for you to switch products, the harder it is for you to switch from one company to another in your insurance or your cell phone or your type of computer, the less competition, the worse a job they do of catering to your preferences. For example, if you can't switch at all, you're basically a slave. If you have no choice, no exit, the company doesn't care what you think. Now there's another, there's another problem and an observation that seems to have been unique to me is the barrier to entry. How hard is it to start a new company in this industry? For example, in the internet industry, to create a website, this is the capital that I need. Right, one laptop and I can start a new, a new web company. To enter the government industry, you need some physical space that allows a political experiment. You need the ocean or a charter city or to win a war or a revolution. That's a really high barrier to entry. And that makes it very hard to have the process of discovery that leads to better products and innovation. Now this, this barriers to entry argument, this is an, an Austrian argument. So we have to move away from the static world and say that to come up with good rules and good institutions requires a discovery process. Trial and error experimentation is the only way to solve the hard, hard problem of creating a set of rules and institutions. And so in order to have trial and error experimentation, we need entry. People have to be able to do new things. This is especially true because what, what we're experimenting with is the actual organizational structure, the, the form of government. So it's not like a company just producing a new product. It's like the very corporate structure of the company itself has changed. And to do that, you need a blank slate. You need to start something in a new place. So that's the model that was very, very quick. We've got uh, papers on our website exploring this in more detail, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about it. You should also uh, check out our blog, Let a Thousand Nations Bloom, um, a thousandnations.com to learn where uh, Mike and Michael back there are, are authors with me to learn a lot about this. Um, so before I talk about seasteading, I'm just gonna make some very quick points about how different a way of thinking this is. For those of you who came into libertarianism by degrees, you may have noticed that your whole way of looking at the world, it changed. You know, when you learned about the gun in the room, the idea that every government program is at its root supported by violence, you see things really differently. But it takes time to integrate that perspective into your life. And so this way of thinking of, of competition and incentives at a root level, it's very hard to apply to our activism. Um, it's, it takes a lot of time and practice over time and being challenged. 
So I look forward to conversations with you and in the q and A, I'm going to be looking for times when people have assumptions about how to change and improve government that are contradicted by this model and so that we can have a dialogue so that people can learn. Because just, just hearing about it doesn't help you unroot all the places in your mind where you have strategies that don't take these ideas into account. And you know, I think about this as competing instead of complaining, right? Where if, you, if we just forgot about government, we just said there's some industry which is a cartel of a small number of monopolies that give terrible service. Now there's two different strategies that we're thinking about to improve this industry. One of them is we're going to get a lot of people together and try to convince them that they get bad service. And we're going we're to write letters to the monopoly. And, and they do, these monopolies, they do, they do customer surveys every two years. So we're going to form a group that's going to try to all write the same thing on the customer survey about how we don't like our service. That's option one. Option two is let's figure out how to compete with these guys. Let's disrupt this industry. Let's build a better alternative. Now, you, you ask anyone who's versed in economics, you ask any libertarian, they say option two, way better. Competition is the answer. But what do we do in politics almost all the time? We do option one. Because we just don't, we don't use the part of our brain that's devoted to entrepreneurship and commerce for thinking about these problems. And this, I'm very excited about this conference as being a chance for us to think about things differently. Think about things in the idea of providing choice, exit, entre entry for new entrepreneurs trying to create new things. Um, you know, one of, we all have our pet peeves, so the idea of winning the war of ideas, I think is incredibly moving and noble and false. That it simply does not describe the world we live in that the best ideas win. When there are political pressures, the best ideas don't win. You know, look at it with, I mean, this is controversial, but say global warming. Whichever side you believe in, it's clear that the science on both sides is very bad because it's so politicized. There's so much money and so much emotion at stake. When politics is involved, the best ideas don't win. And so having, slight, having better ideas and preaching better ideas, we're not gonna win. So instead of winning the war of ideas, let's win the actual war by creating actual free societies. And you know, I find this incredibly empowering and inspiring. You know, it makes me happier to think about the possibility of what we can create than to complain about how the current world is not what we like. And it's very, very natural to complain. I mean, I, I feel the instinct constantly, but it's not what's gonna move us forward, and it, it's not what makes us happy, and it does not lead to the right actions. It leads to things like, how can we convince these bad people doing bad things that they're bad? As opposed to, what can I build that makes things better? So, seasteading. So literally seasteading means to build new countries on the ocean, to settle the oceans. In this theoretical framework I just presented, we can see why we'd want to do that. If the, with a dysfunctional industry, because it's hard to switch from country to country and it's hard for an entrepreneur to create a new country, if we go to the ocean, we can fix both of these. So the ocean is not just pretty, although it is very pretty, but it's, it's empty and the barrier to settling it is much lower than trying to take some existing bit of land. And even more importantly, if we solve the problems of, of living on the ocean in terms of the technological challenges and the legal barriers, once we've done that once, then seastead, free seastead cities can spring up all over the Earth's oceans. So I think, you know, in some ways it's, it's more challenging than say getting a single charter city created, but the scale is so much bigger. You do it once and we have free cities everywhere all over the world competing with each other. You unlock this dynamic process of continual innovation and sets of rules. And there's another cool difference about the ocean, which is that physically it's a different medium. This is a picture of the Empire State Building and a large cruise ship at the same scale. So on the ocean, large buildings just move around as, as the regular course of being. What will this do to a, a society to have cities that you can rearrange. I mean, we act, it actually just came up in the last talk, the idea that it affected the government models, the fact that these buildings that were developed were locked into place. Sece what if secession was guaranteed by the laws of physics instead of some piece of paper? What if you could physically remove yourself from another government? What does that do? And one of the things that, that comes from this is that maritime law says that you plug into international sovereignty by flying a flag 
in a registry in that country that you can change year by year. So it's a virtual association between one ship and one country. What is that? It's a competitive market. Very different from one spot on land where you may invest and you may create it, but the country may, may, may take it back. On the ocean, you have this sort of inherent hostage that you can switch providers, and not by creating something new and innovative, but this is what international maritime law already says. So we can take advantage of this dynamic physical infrastructure and this existing market in order to get this system of competitive governance that will improve government technology on the ocean.